Hey, enjoy all the colorful leaves before they fall because winter is almost here. Good news is ski season is also almost here. And there's no one more ready for the start of ski season than you as downhill legend Michaela Schifrin. I, I can say my brother as well, but we also going to talk about Michigan and have they and Jim Harbaugh try to, to cheat a little bit too much. From Wondery, I'm Ryan Shazier. Oh, I'm sure this will be a perfectly objective conversation. I'm Dave Damashek. And I'm unbiased. And this is Don't Call It A Comeback. Don't call it a comeback. I've been waiting on this moment my whole life. Can't call it a comeback. Everybody to your feet, make arenas ride. Yeah, I'm saying from the left to right. We get it on tonight. We do it all, but we don't back down. Just give me one shot, one chance, I'ma take it. Fixing up the game, but these records I keep on breaking. Break it. All right, before we get going, let's talk about Lamar Jackson and what they did to the Lions this week. Oh, no, we're already going 5 0. Let's get into it, though. Yeah, the Ravens were su- against the Lions was supposed to be the game of the week. It was a blowout early, at least for this October Sunday in Charm City. Lamar and his pals made those Lions look like pretenders. Shazier, do you think MVP Lamar Jackson is back? I definitely think MVP Lamar Jackson is back. I don't know if he's my MVP favorite right now. Obviously, he's playing great ball right now. I wouldn't say he's my favorite, but I will say he's very high in the MVP race right now. And the reason is because of just how he's throwing the ball as well. With him being in this time marking offense, man, you're just seeing such an improvement with how they're moving the ball, keeping them in the pocket, and allowing him to run when he needs to run. But I, I think, you know, Lamar Jackson, man, he's he's one of those type of players that if you don't play him on a regular basis like the Cincinnati Bengals, like the Cleveland Browns, like the Pittsburgh Steelers and, you know, Kansas City and, and Buffalo, if you're not one of those type of teams that play him on a consistent basis, man, Lamar and the Ravens, they can jump up on you really fast. And you see that right now with how they beat up on the Lions this week. I don't mean to play cynic here. <clears throat> Obviously, if you're a newcomer to the show, I happen to be a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. This does not come from a place of rooting against that team. Rather, I don't know if this Ravens defense is as good as some of the additions have been over the last decade. I also have some questions when the UR is dependent on what the O-line and the push it gets. I'm concerned about the anchor of that, Ronnie Stanley, his long-term health. It's been a bit spotty over the last several years now. However, in the upgrade in positions, a flowers and beyond. The question is, though, Shazier, you talk about familiarity with number eight and how that can help you obviously slow him down a little bit. No one does a better job in terms of win losses at minimum than the Steelers do against Lamar Jackson. What is the trick to slowing him down? I guess you can go back to 2019 when he got that MVP, but about halfway through 2023, It's a little bit different. He's slinging it a little bit more. He still has those wheels, though, that make him a real tough stop. What is the trick to slowing down eight in that offense? I think one of the things that Coach Tomlin and the Pittsburgh Steelers do a really good job of when it comes to slowing down Lamar Jackson is understanding that he's a dynamic runner. And every team is like, hey, we're going to beat him by making us beat him by his arm. But the way you have to make him beat him by his arm is a lot of teams, especially in the NFC, he has a record of 16-1 versus the NFC. So a lot of teams in the NFC, they see him like, man, we can't allow him to beat us with his legs. So their D linemen rarely contain and they sit in zone. So then... The, the receiver just wa- running wide open all over the place. And Lamar Jackson is an MVP quarterback. He's He is a quarterback that can throw for 4,000 yards in the NFL. So you just can't sit back there and then not rush him at all. A lot of teams that do re- very well versus him, they send the blitz, but they also go in man coverage. While a lot of teams are very scared to go into man coverage because the threat of his legs. So you sit in man coverage, have a some type of zone, not is on a spy on him or you tell your your D lineman rush the passer 
have the D tackles rush up the lanes and then have the outside guys contain and allow them to climb the pocket but don't go past Lamar. So when Lamar tries to step up, you have guys like Cam Hayward, you have those big D tackles that are pushing his O-lineman into his lap. But then once he's tried to once he try to go outside, they're rushing up the field, but they're not going past him, which allows them to make him run deeper outside the pocket in almost like a bubble. And once he runs, start running that bubble, that spy guy comes, and you and then now he has to throw a ball on the run. And I don't care if you're Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, and Rodgers, all these guys have amazing arms, but throwing on the run, they're all a little bit less accurate than they are sitting in the pocket. And if you're a man-to-man coverage, that's when – you have turnovers happen and you have a lot of incompletions. And that's how the Steelers do a really good job. But then they also mix in zones here and there. Lamar Jackson is not one of those guys that you're just going to stop. But he's one of those guys you want to make sure you can contain them as much as you can and allow them to have short field. I mean, allow them to play on a longer field than a shorter one. I think you hit on the things that I obviously a little bit less informed than you have observed. And I think it goes back to the 2019 playoffs against the Tennessee Titans. Easier said than just copy their blueprint because every team doesn't have a prime Jarrell Casey and a Jeffrey Simmons to get that inside push that you talk about. And that's a common theme with whether it's Tom Brady or Lamar Jackson. No QB in the year of the Lord 2023 wants those 300 pound guys moving as fast as they do, giving you that pressure right in your face like that. Lamar's no different, but it also has the double down effect because we know he can run as long as your outside guys have some discipline and don't run too deep in their pass rush. Right. You can kind of contain Lamar Jackson. It's not, though, like you're going to hold him to nothing. He is going to get you at some point. It's uh, the point is limiting that. One more question on Lamar, and it's a little bit of cynicism. Have you seen, number 50, that Lamar is getting got more than he used to. In 2019, 2020, he was like a matador treating all the NFL defenders like uh, like giant bulls, and he would olay them and just be left standing there while they would fall into the sideline. And it was especially vexing. Now, though, I feel like he's taken some smacks. So it's not the reason he got hurt last year or the year before that, but they are catching up with him a little bit. Is he slowing down, or are they figuring him out a little bit more across the NFL? I, w- I want to say Lamar Jackson is slowing down. I just think he understands how much he means to the team. So, like, even when I watched Jalen Hurts the other day, last year Jalen Hurts trying to run guys over, you know, and then now you see Jalen Hurts, a guy, he did a read option, and a guy was running up to him, and he just slid. He was like, yeah, you're not hitting me for no reason right now. I think it's more of those type of situations. Lamar, guys are getting close to him, and then instead of making them miss and try to hit the home run, Lamar is understanding, hey, let me get everything I can get. If you if you can get, if I can shake you, I'm going to try, but I'm not going to try to do too much. And then a lot of those tackles aren't as hard as they would be when he played when he was younger. When he was younger, it was either I'm going to hit a big play on you or you're going to make a big hit on me. Now, a lot of those tackles, they might catch up to him, but he doesn't get tackled as hard. It, It doesn't hurt as much and he can get back up and be the quarterback that his team needs him to be. Well, it's it's a fascinating discussion, and it, it represents, since Lamar Jackson took over for Joe Flacco, a big break. The ongoing theme, I feel like, of the Ravens and Steelers rivalry is that they're mere images of each other. The Steelers, number eight, and the Ravens, number eight, are two very different cats playing the same position there, so it adds a new layer to the great rivalry. And speaking of rivalries, that's your pro one. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on your college one, Mr. Buckeye. We'll do that, but stay tuned for Michaela Schifrin on Don't Call It a Comeback right after this break. Don't call it a comeback. Shit, let's get into this Michaela Schifrin comeback. As you wish. The American skiing superstar has been a winner since her time in the Junior League, stacking up accolades at every level of the sport. But in the winter of 2020, Michaela's father passed away, and some untimely injury luck pushed Michaela into a rough patch that culminated in a shockingly poor performance at the 2022 Winter Olympics. Shocker right off the bat. Didn't even get into the course. Uh, You know, I I can't think of a time that Michaela Schiffer has skied out in back-to-back races in the 11 years that she's been on the World Cup. 
But in the season that followed, Michaela was able to right the ship and seize the all-time record for the most wins ever recorded in an international competition. For more on Michaela's return to the top of the skiing world, shouldn't we really have said top of the mountain? Because skiing, you go... Anyway... We are honored to have one of the brightest American stars in any sport here with us today, Michaela. Welcome to Don't Call It a Comeback. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> well, you not doing? so bad. Not as good as you. Not as successful as you. But let's go oh. back a couple few years, shall we? Early 2020, you're in first place on your way to a fourth consecutive World Cup title. Then your father passes away and the pandemic ends the season early. How do you find your way back to skiing competitively after you have to deal with all that at one time just a couple few years ago? Oh, gosh. Um, that is a very, that's a loaded question. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, after that, that season was strange to begin with. I was I was struggling to begin with. Um, I was I had just won some races and then. Um, and my dad was there for those races in Bulgaria and then he, and he flew home and I was going to a little training prep block before my next races. And my brother called and said that dad, you know, dad had been home for about, I don't know, 24 hours and he had an accident. And it's like your entire, you know, your world, I think you've probably heard this before, your world spinning on an axis and all of a sudden that axis is completely upended. And um, my mom and I flew home. My mom's one of my coaches. So she was there in Italy with me and we flew home together. And at that point we were flying home to say goodbye. We knew that he was not going to ever be, um, basically ever be able to wake up again. So it was like, hang on, keep his heart beating. We're coming home to say goodbye. And that whole experience, leaving, just ditching the World Cup, leaving it behind completely. Up until that point, you know, I was 25 years old. And up until that point, ever since I was 15, the World Cup, my, the ski racing, this had been sort of the center of my universe. And um, just leaving it behind like that was a little bit jarring for me. I didn't really realize it at the time, but in the kind of years to follow, it was like, how could I leave something that I thought I loved so much so quickly? It's just one of those things that your priorities completely shift. And I did not, I was not planning on coming back, to be honest. Um, I didn't really have much of a plan, but when I came home, all of our family was here and we were just trying to get through the immediate time. And I, a couple people asked, you know, when are you going back to Europe and are you going to finish the season? I was like, no. I'm not, I'm probably not going to ski again, actually. Um, and it took quite, it took, you know, three, three weeks to even want to put on my ski boots and then four weeks with a little bit of skiing in there to feel like, okay, I can, I, I do still love this sport. It's just a weird sort of, it's a different perspective on it. Um, and that, I guess that was the most important step for me in the whole yeah, if you call it a uh, return to skiing, the most important step was just choosing to try to ski again, basically. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question, and because when I got injured, I wasn't able to go back to football. Uh, so I had a spinal cord injury, and I I wasn't able to go back to football. So uh, I ended up learning how to walk again, and you know, end up it's tough because I can't go back to the sport I love, but. With you, you thought about not skiing and like, what is the process of getting back into the sport? Because I know when I started, when I was younger, uh, we played football almost all the time, almost every yeah. single day. Like, because I lived in Florida. So when I live in PA, you can't play football in the winter, you know, but you can, yeah. but you get, you know, but in Florida, you can. Yeah. So how, how did, how did, what was that process like, you know, just trying to get your mindset back together to, to get back out there on the slopes. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, you know, February period, beginning of February when my dad passed and then really the end of February before I even thought about that. Then at that point I had basically skied a couple runs. I skied a couple days in a row. Um, to be honest, it's, it's a different, it's a different kind of thing. Like I've had physical injuries and 
nothing like a spinal cord injury. So I definitely want to no, make you're that fine. No, you're fine. But, I um, but I know the feeling of having that injury and just feeling like this didn't change what my world is still centered around the, my sport and I want to get back to it. That never changed. And it's like the emotional, the, the trauma that goes along with that, your, your literal focus of life completely shifts. Um, so coming back to it, it, you know, like you said, you play football every day. It's, we can't ski every single day. We can only ski the days we have access to snow. So, you know, during the summertime, well, I'm about to travel to Chile for three weeks of ski camp for on snow training. And otherwise for the most, most of the summer, I've just been in the gym every day. Um, and of course, once winter hits, then we're skiing every single day, but it's, it's definitely, it's very definitely condition and environment dependent. Um, and in that time in February, we were, you know, we were in the thick of winter and I was like, it's all around me. And I just have to, I just have to get up the courage to go out and ski and get some training days in, um, and what I realized that during that time was how, like one of my strengths before was kind of focus, being able to focus and have the proper intensity in my focus. Um, and I could, you know, I could hold my focus for an entire training session, you know, in skiing, that's, it's like a high level of intensity for any, like from 8 a.m. until noon or 1 p.m. It's like the five hours straight of every... <laughs> every single minute on the minute, you have to be going as hard as you can kind of a thing. And um, I struggled with that getting back. That was the probably one, the hardest thing was to be able to hold my energy, maybe more physical as well, but maybe probably more mental than anything um, throughout a training session. My first couple training sessions, like, you know, if I'm normally taking I don't know, nine runs to 15 runs in a session. Um, my first training session back, I think I got to three and I, it was low intensity. I was breaking up the course into sections and, and I like, I couldn't do it. I said to my coaches, I think I need to go home now. So it was a, it was actually, it's been a really long road back to feeling like I even have the mental strength, um, it has nothing to do with pressure or anything. It's just, it's like a, it's like an injury to the brain or injury to the soul. And the recovery from that is really unpredictable. So that was just, it was basically just doing it, like getting the repetition in and doing it, even though some days I was really tired for the entire next season, the 2021 season, I felt like I was completely in a fog for the, the whole season. Um, and going into 2022 as well, leading into the Olympics, it was a, it was like some days the fog would lift, but it was still very much um, kind of a blurry vision sort of a thing. And I don't know, it's just like keep going. I guess it's not. It doesn't feel like a lot of inspiration. It's just like just keep going. No, it, it, it sounds like you went through it where, where skiing is your life and then you have a major inflection point in your life and you say there's more to life than this sport and then you realize, well, I'm merely surviving without this sport. I love doing it. It, it, it is my reason for living in, in, in on some level, but you mentioned the right level of intensity. It sounds like you had a hard time recapturing where that was and so you go to the 2022 Olympics with all this going on, a lot of things conspiring against you. Is that another inflection point? How does that failure sort of inform where you go from that point on? During the, during the games, I remember saying in an interview, like, it's just, this is making me question everything I thought I knew about skiing because really I just, I rely on technique and the tactics just kind of the the strategy of the sport. It's not like I'm never hoping I'm never, I'm never banking on luck. Um, of course there's always luck involved with any win. And, and there's always some level of, um, I don't know, unluckiness when you, when you have really tough, maybe not tough races, but especially with bad crashes for sure. Luck is a part of it, but I like I do the work to ideally not rely on luck in those moments, like at the Olympics. And 
I was skiing well. I mean, we had been training there. I'd been there three weeks leading up to the my first race training and skiing really, really well. Um, I struggled a little bit with the conditions, just trying to, uh, it's a different kind of snow conditions. We don't really have to get into the nitty gritty of it, but it's like, I don't know if it, if, if it's maybe similar to the feeling of changing from playing on turf to playing on natural grass. Um, yeah, I, I can understand that all the way. <laughs> Look at you I mean, making it relatable yeah. for Florida's <laughs> own Ryan Shazier. Yeah, yeah, He's never yeah. seen yeah. snow. I don't think yeah. Yeah, he had I, until he got the no, Pittsburgh. I, I have a story. I'm, I'm going to add it in here. I wasn't going to add it, but I have a story I got to tell you when we're done. So. Please do. No, oh, no, but you keep going. Yeah, so <laughs> you keep going. All right. So that, I mean, there's a lot, there were a lot of factors going on there, but I remember saying, you know, this just makes me question everything. And part of that was because up until that point, I'd never, ever been to a race, a race series. Like, I just never experienced something where so many races went consecutively wrong when I thought that I had so much of the preparation in, in a, in a good way. And it wasn't, it wasn't really even pressure. It wasn't feeling like I didn't have the, the performance anxiety feeling I've had that before. And it wasn't that it was just, I was ready. I felt my intensity was high. I felt like in all other worlds and every other experience I've had, the mentality I had normally equates to at least a podium or at the very least finishing. So there was, you know, whatever, however many races that I, I didn't even, like, I didn't make it past the ninth gate. And that, for me, it was just mind boggling. But it wasn't so much of a shift in my universe. It was just, it was just kind of a mo like, moment or a long, long string of moments of acceptance. Like, sometimes there's lessons you can learn from it. And there's things that I'll try to do maybe a little bit differently for the next Olympics. It's also going to be in a completely different climate zone that in a place where we ski every single year and we race every single year. So there's a lot of pieces that would be different anyway, but the idea that like I go into it thinking I have to accept whatever happens. I, I hope I get a medal and I really want to perform well. And like my greatest hope is that this all goes well. I've done my preparation to give myself the best shot I have. And I have to accept whatever happens. And that was kind of the Beijing lesson was just like, you don't get a choice. You, you, got, you have to take it and you have to accept it. And then you just decide like, is it worth, do I, do I want to continue or not? Or for me, that was never a question. It was just like, oh, <laughs> get me out of here. So I want to I want to ask you a question as a you know as a professional athlete, the one thing that people always say you know is like don't don't pay attention to the critics, don't read the media, like don't oh, and yeah. everybody's like everybody's like I don't I don't I don't pay attention to that stuff, and it's yeah. like everybody yeah, does, right. you know, what I'm <laughs> right? So when that moment happened and everybody was like, oh, I think this is you know Michaela might not be the same, everything yeah. like she might she might be done. Like, how did you respond to people saying all that stuff about you? You know, I actually wasn't super bothered by the people who said, like, maybe this is it. Maybe she's done. Maybe she's never going to come back as strong as she was. I mean, it was almost like thoughts that were going through my own head. And I was like, right on, man. I, I'd like to know that, too. <laughs> um, so that wasn't so much of a bother. It's the people who say things like, well, for instance, people say you're worthless because you couldn't get gold. You were supposed to get gold. Don't bother coming home. Don't bother you. You're a poor representation of the United States because you didn't win the medal. And it's like, it doesn't matter what else you do in your career. You're a failure forever because you didn't get an Olympic medal. And I'm like, I have two gold medals, but also that's not even the point. Why would you say that about a human? So that was, those were the comments that I would see that I was like, oh my God. It's a it's, lot of nasty people no, out here. It, like, that's a lot. The the kind of the doubts of that happens every single day with every single person ever. You know, you have it with every great football star that's ever existed. Soccer players, tennis, whatever. Everybody goes through highs and lows. And in the highs, in the great moments, every, the media and all of the fans, everyone's like, they're unstoppable. They're unbeatable. And in the low moments, they're like, they're never coming back. It's 
so it's one of the most predictable human, like, <laughs> I don't know, functions or patterns, I think. So it almost does, that doesn't really bother me anymore. But I definitely, like, I would say, I, I don't know. There's probably athletes out there who do manage to not look at the comments or if they see them, they actually don't care. There must I be I wasn't one of them. I wasn't one of them. <laughs> yeah. I've never, I've never come across one who didn't care. Um, I mean, there's a couple athletes who don't manage their own social medias at all and they just never go on it. So then, you, you know, what you don't know won't kill you. But gosh, it's hard. It's hard this day and age to avoid any comment whatsoever. The worst, the worst one I ever got, I was in the hospital rehabbing and somebody was like, yeah, you deserve to be hurt. I was like, yeah, that, yeah, oh. yeah, that was, that was, it was pretty bad, you know, so that's so bad. And what, like, what is, what are you, what are you going through in life that you feel like you, not only did you think it, which shame on you for thinking it, but that you actually thought you want to, you want to say it. And then you wrote it out and you're like, no, this is a good idea. I'm going to hit send. Like, what the hell? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's, no, no, you're fine. Everyone it's, it's, wants to make an impact in the world. And in the 21st century, social media has allowed everyone to yeah. have that sense, at least. And if you can't do it positively, people tend to do it negatively to try to put a dent yeah. into people on your level. Speaking of which, so you you go through that 500 yards of awfulness the last couple of years, some some real downs in your career and in your life at large. And then this March, you pass Ingmar Stenmark. I know that name. He was skiing before I was alive. You pass him your 87th World Cup win. That makes yeah. you number one for all of time. Now it's an individual sport by definition. Yeah. How does that what what does that mean to you in this quintessentially individual sport that has so many ups and downs? Pun, yeah. I guess, intended a little bit, but either way, uh, <laughs> how's it feel to be number one for all of time? Oh gosh. Well, it's a, it's a strange sort of a feeling because during this season, I, you know, I was asked a lot about how much it would mean to me if I hit the record, if I match the record, if I reset the record. There were a lot of records on the line this season just from start to finish, basically. And that, in a weird, like, in the least arrogant way, in the most, like, I don't know how to really put this, but... I've gotten a little bit used to sort of the statistics and the records and people talking about those things. But normally it's, you know, for my 50th victory, people were saying, you know, you're, you're about to hit 50. What would that mean to you? And I remember that being the last real time I was truly affected by the record talk and the, the talk of winning and that kind of thing. Beyond, I was just like, I can't let this make me more nervous this is just, it's a natural talk people are going to have, you know, this season was, I'm not going to say tough. It was actually a wonderful season. Um, from a, like from a mentality perspective, the way that I skied was just, it was just so much fun. It's, it's exhilarating to ski really, really well and really fast. And even in the races that I didn't win, I was so proud of kind of the technique that I brought to the to the races. So that's a side note, but, um, you know, people, as I got closer to 86 and then 87, of course, people were like, it's going to happen today. When's it going to happen? Are you going to do it? What would it mean to you? But, and it's just, it's just hammering, hammering, hammering him. You're like, ah, I don't let, like, let me think for a second. And I kept saying to everyone, I base more or less, I don't care. Um, which is, not true. I, I, of course I care. I just, it's not the focus. And I kept trying to reiterate that. And people were just like, nah, I don't believe you. So they just kept asking and you get in this weird phase where the, like the number of the, just the external input starts to almost override your internal input. And as I got closer to 86, there was a race series. Um, I was in Norway. I was just thinking, it was a speed series, which is not like I have won speed races, but it's, I'm not necessarily the person who's expected to win in super, super G maybe, but definitely not downhill. So, um, I was thinking, gosh, it'd be so great if I could just get that over and done with. And then nobody's going to ask anymore. And it, 
course, that was my mindset. I, it didn't happen that race series. And then I was thinking, gosh, I've been so stressed out about this. I got to figure out, I have to take, I've got to take a different plan. Like I'm, I don't care again. I, I really don't. I letting it go when people say like in one ear, out the other. And the next race series I went to in Sweden is when it happened. And I really, those races, I can honestly say I, w- I was very conscious of it being the 86th and the 87th victory. And I really couldn't care less about those numbers. I just had, I had a really specific idea in mind of how I wanted to ski. And that was the most, oh my God, it was the most liberating thing. But then right after that, crossed the finish line, won the slalom race. That's the 87th victory moment of glory. The first thing that I was asked after is when are you going to get to a hundred? And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so it's just, it's like life lessons, you know? It's always what's next. And that's well, fine. People always want more. Yeah, always want more. But it's, I mean, you, like you do too. I do too. Yeah. We all yeah. want more. We all want to know what's next. And that's yeah. just like reframe it in your mind. And then it's not so scary, I guess. So ever since you was a kid, you have two, you have two things on your helmet. One of them is be nice, think first, have fun. And the other one is, I know what it means, but it's uh, A-B-F-T-T-B. Uh, can you tell us what those, what those, like the significance of, of both of those are? Yeah. So be nice, think first, have fun. That is, those are the golden rules. And I'm not sure if it actually came from my parents or if they heard it somewhere else and sort of instated those into our family, but Um, it was something that my dad particularly really drove home and my brother and myself all growing up, you know, we'd, we'd be in the car coming home from school and he'd be like, what are the golden rules? And we're sitting in the backseat, like, be nice, think first, have fun. (laughs) And, and that was, it actually started out just be nice, think first. And we sort of added have fun partway through. Um, it was like, he didn't want to add that when we could use it against him. We could say, well, the golden rule is to have fun. So you should let us go hang out with our friends or something. It was like, we had to be old enough for us to understand that the fun part is like enjoyment in what you're doing, not necessarily just like living life for fun and on a whim. Um, But yeah, so that's, that is on my helmet. And then the other one, ABFTTB, that was an acronym that was written on a poster for me by Heidi Volker, who was one of my big, big idols in the sport. Um, she wrote, and she, I she think she wrote this on quite a few posters. It was always like, always beat the boys or always be faster than the boys. Um, and I, I just was super inspired by her. So when I was eight years old, seven years old, I wanted to take that acronym or it's take that saying and turn it into an acronym. And I wrote on my skis for a really long time until I got a proper ski technician and they, I like, I don't write things on my skis anymore. I'm not really allowed to (laughs) touch them. Obviously I have to touch my skis. Um, but yeah, no, they, my skis are like babies. So they, they're like, don't, don't write something on there. Um, yeah. So that now that's on my helmet too. And I do want to say like, just quick little clarification. I talk a lot, as you can tell. Um, You're fine. We're enjoying it. (laughs) It's like always be faster than the boys is sort of a funny, especially this day and age. You know, I wrote it on my skis um, before there was so much talk about kind of the pay gap inequality and um, promoting women in business, women in sport, women in STEM, all of these incredible initiatives. But you know, at the time I was like, oh, I was be faster than the boys. And my goal as a little racer, I always wanted to beat the guys. You know, it was like the guys would say, oh, we just got chipped by Michaela. And that was like, that was really fun for me. But, uh, you know, you're six, seven, eight years old. You don't like, you don't really see the kind of biological differences at that age. And then now I'm... I'm careful to say it because I want to be clear that my goal is not to beat men. (laughs) I, (laughs) my goal 
you know, yeah, my goal is to be the best that I can be. Mm-hmm. And I'm extremely inspired by um, what the men are able to do on their skis and on the World Cup circuit. And I love the fact that our women's circuit, our level has raised so much. The depth we have is so much higher. The competition level is so much higher. And a lot of that, it's it's not a it's not a lie. It's not a secret. We a lot a lot of us take inspiration from watching, um, watching the men race, competing against them when we're training together, and that's kind of it's sort of changed meanings for me over the years. It literally, I used to literally just want to beat the boys, and now it's more like raise the level of the sport based on the inspiration you find around you, which includes the men. Which is not a great acronym, so. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Listen, whether you wanted to do it or not, you did it. You beat <laughs> Stenmark and every other person who has ever walked the planet Earth. So I'm going to congratulate you for that. And before we let you go, my last question for you is, your comeback story, I'm not going to say it's complete. There's another chapter or more for you to write yet, but it's been a great rebound for you over the last three years. So with Thanks. your comeback story now in the books, who should we next feature as a comeback story here on the show? Oh my gosh. Well, I bet you could probably guess one of the first people that is coming to my mind. Um, she's a gymnast. Oh. <laughs> well, actually, Lindsay, she's had insane comebacks. That's true. So she would be a great person to come on your show. Um, I was thinking of Simone. But... That's really up to you guys. You're the experts in that area. No, we, no, we want we want to we want to we want your advice. We want your you know your thought because you know it's, it's like to me. I think Simone will be would be awesome. She's been through a lot of ups and downs. You know when it comes to winning, but then also you know having struggles in the Olympics, like you know as well. And just I, I think that would be a, a amazing story to to have on the podcast. So I really appreciate you for that. And then I promise you that I'll tell you the story. So. I, <laughs> they're probably going. They're probably going to kick this out of the podcast, but I'm, I'm going to tell you that. the story. I'm going to tell you the story anyway. So basically, and I'm sorry, we're kidnapping you for longer than 20 minutes. So, <laughs> uh, so um, me and my wife's first date was on a skiing trip, it, but it was here in. It was here on the East Coast. It was here on the East Coast. We both learned how to ski here on the East Coast, and it was a small. It was a. It was a small resort. It's a really nice resort called Nima Colon. Really nice. They had a look. We went skiing. So I thought I knew how to ski. So basically, we 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 went skiing there. We we did some greens. And I was like, all right, I'm doing well enough. I can advance to a blue. So then, about two years later, this is the this is actually the year I got hurt. But two years later, it was 2017. My friend, he he's from Tahoe. So basically, we oh, yeah. went to we went to Tahoe, then drove over to the the uh, I think it's Park City or wherever the Olympics was over there. So yeah. when we went. It was like a severe snowstorm. Like it was super bad. Like really, really bad. So, so, so then we get to the sea resort and I was like, you know, I skied over here on the East Coast. So I thought, hey, I knew what I was doing. So we get to the ski resort and I look up at the mountain. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. <laughs> I was like, so this is, so this is crazy. It's snowing so bad that they, they said, hey, it's so much snow that all the greens are shut down. <laughs> so we, you have to either sn- ski on a blue or a black, right? So then my friends, I'm like, yo, I, I'm not that comfortable skiing. Like I'm, you know, I was like, I, I, I can do a green, but I don't know how I feel with this. And it's like, oh, this green is like a, this blue is like a green. This is the easiest blue they have, <laughs> yeah, right? Classic. Yeah. So this is, the, this is the easiest blue they have. So this is my first time going on this mountain where the people look like ants on the bottom of the ground. I'm, yeah. I'm skiing. And I couldn't control my skis. Like, it was like, cause you know how they teach you the pizza and the, the, the fry and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I was trying that. It wasn't working. And then I'm, <laughs> I'm just falling. Like, I'm, I'm intentionally falling because this is the, like, this is, it was like, ju- it, yeah, it was like May or June. So it was like, it was not, it was like May. So it was, it was snowing a lot, but everywhere else in the country is not snowing that bad. So I was yeah. like, I'm not about to get hurt up here because I'm about to get, like this was my contract year. I'm not about to get hurt before I get paid. So basically, yeah, it's no time. I, yeah. So I kept falling down on purpose, and then I just literally just laid on the mountain. Like I laid on the mountain. People kept 
going past me and it was like, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not okay. I'm not going to make it down this mountain. So basically the ski patrol came and got me and then like put me in a little like bag. <laughs> yes. And then like two people skied me down the, down the, uh, down the mountain. I was like, y'all need to turn this into a ride. This was actually pretty goddamn fun. But it was, <laughs> but it was, it was like to that, like, I haven't, I haven't, I, I love skiing. Like when I went skiing, I loved it, but it was just, I didn't get to, you know, like actually ski on a mountain like that before. So I was just scared. So it was just that that's my story. But it and uh I, I enjoy it and love watching you and everybody else ski. It's just now nah, I don't even touch it. I'm scared now. Uh, I love my I love that you loved it so much. And it is, it's true. The West Coast mountains are bigger and the snowstorms are bigger. And I would say skiing in the east is in a lot of cases it's actually harder, but it's not you don't come across as steep slopes and long trails but oh god i'm sorry you know if my mom she's the greatest coach on the planet if she had passed by you she would have stopped she'd been like all right listen here man you gotta stand yourself back up <laughs> and you this is what we're gonna do when my brother and i have a joke she can teach anybody how to be a world cup skier in five minutes and she will do it while we we're like out free skiing and she's like, I got to go help this person. They're struggling. Uh, and I would have definitely used it. I would have definitely used it because I, de I enjoyed it. Second. It's just, it's, it's like not so hard. It's just really hard to get them. The thing that allows you to make the next leap. And that's, Man, Dave, I'm sorry. The, the, the world's great. The, the the world's great greatest skier is going to tell me it's not that hard. It's all good. But, all right. Well, I was. <laughs> I, I, I I do have to say, I was once at a baseball game and Kareem Abdul Jabbar threw out the first pitch, and it was such an atrocity. I declared, "What an embarrassment to the sport of basketball." I'm going to say the same to you, Shazier, about you skiing. What does this say for football players? You just laid on the side of the hill until they came and pulled you no, out of there. It's, 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 it's the devil. Truth. You probably weren't even allowed to ski. I feel like most. We're, we're really not. We're really not technically allowed to ski. But in your contract, you're not allowed to. Like, oh, we yeah, don't have right. that in our contracts. We're just, it's like, don't do anything stupid. But our <laughs> contracts don't say, like, you can't play basketball or football or literally any. It's like, do what you want, get strong. I mean, there's not really too many things out there that are more extreme than skiing besides, like, like freestyle, maybe. <laughs> I'll say this. You had a chance to make fun of Shazier and you didn't do it. So you live by your creed to review as we wrap up here. Be nice. Think first. Have fun. You've said it all. Michaela Schifrin, congratulations on the success. Looking forward to more of it in 2024. And before we get to those Olympics, there's still some action we're looking forward to watching. In the meantime, thanks so much for all the time today. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. So much fun. Michaela, thank you so much for joining us today. Best wishes on the slopes. And next up for us, I went to the Steelers game in LA this weekend, and I may have cracked the secret to their success. Could it be that they have the best coach in all the NFL? Let's talk about it. Time for some other comeback stories in the news we need to give a look at this week. This is The Checkdown. Shazier and I are going to give each other one comeback story from the news this week. 30 seconds on the clock to break it down. The only question I have before I ask another question, so I guess I have two. Are you ready, 5-0? Yes, sir. Let's get it. Okay. It's here now. Michigan. You heard about this. They're under some fire for stealing their opponent's signs. Now, this is not the first time football fans have heard about this. Of course, Steelers fans in particular, others in the AFC, some of the Patriots' foes in Super Bowls, have some issues with Spygate, if you remember that. How much of an advantage, in this case, are Harbaugh and company actually getting from doing this? So I'm just going to let you know right now, this is going to take longer than 30 seconds. So okay. first of all, stealing signs is... It just the integrity of the game, that's something that you do not do. And then obviously they said this is something that Michigan has done the last three years. So to me, it's a very it's very frustrating to see that they're continuing to do things to try to, you know, get the edge. You know, Ohio State, we got in trouble for tattoos and, you know, selling stuff for rings, but we didn't cheat. 
You know, it's like for, to me to steal signs. That's basically like going to somebody's practice, seeing what they're doing, and then every time they call a play, you know what the play is. And then especially in college, the, the linebackers and safeties in college they don't check the defenses. So if the quarterback gets a check from his coach then they already know what you're already in because they see the signal that you pull out. And then now it's allowing Michigan quarterback J.J. or the team of North quarterback J.J. to be able just to thread the needle and get it to who he wants to get it to because he already understands what you're in. While if while in the NFL, if somebody checks, you can make a check as well. And then that's a huge advantage in college if you already know what they're in compared to if you are if you don't. And I'll, and I'll just take a minute. There, there we go. Mike, let, let me just throw a couple questions for you. Common cynicism about your cynicism or skepticism about what Har- Harbaugh's doing. Everyone does it. How say you? You say everybody is still signs? So I'm, not, thing- I'm saying I am representing the, the voice, the pushback that people give. Oh, come on. Don't be Pollyanna. Every team does this. They just got caught doing it. Fair enough. I, I I wouldn't say that because the reason I was the reason I, I would say that every team doesn't do it is because you will be able to tell when coaches are calling the plays like the plays will probably come in later or that you know or like you normally see when you watch like if you watch Michigan State play they'll go up there JJ looks at the, the the coach then he actually puts them in the situation that they need to be in it's much better for offense than it is for defense if like because if you're if if you're on the offensive side of the ball going against a defense and you see what a defense line up in if we're in cover three you know to go up the seams if we're in cover two you know to go in the deep middle or behind the corners you know oh I know how to go in a run here I know to go in a run pass there if it's a if you're on a, if you're on the defensive side and you see what the offensive plays it's kind of like you the only indicator would probably be more pass or run, but I think it's I think that's more of a tougher situation when it comes to to. But I just I just don't see everybody doing that because a lot of people play with the integrity and they try to you know just play the game the, the right way to play it. Like you might you know if you're on the same sideline and you're watching and see them do si- signals on the other sideline, that's different than recording them taking them back home. And then looking at it, uh, you know, so I don't I don't see everybody doing that. Well, the other question I had for you that I will answer myself, it's a rhetorical one, is, as you just touch on, teams will say, coaches will say, ah, everybody can figure out tendencies. You watch the game. It's 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 overrated. Then the response is, then why would they do it at all? Then why was Michigan bothering with it? If it's so easy to divine those tendencies without doing what Michigan was doing, it's a, it's a difference I'm, between tendencies and then actually having a hundred percent an idea of what somebody else is going to be in. If I, throw I up agree. A sign all right, I want to talk. About, I want to talk is. about something yeah. else. So ask yeah, me your question say, here. Yeah, about to say I can get. I can stay on this all day. Yeah, we better get off this topic. So you was at the Steelers Rams game in LA mm-hmm. this weekend. What was your biggest takeaway from the game? I love, and I know this makes me a cheese ball as a man of my advanced age. Obviously, as a Steelers fan, I like seeing the team stay relevant through seven weeks, four and two. They're in the mix. That's all good stuff. My next couple few months are probably a little bit brighter because I know that Sundays will be meaningful for me as we move into the holiday season. But as a human being, someone 3,000 miles away from my hometown where you sit right now, Shazier, you are a transplant, but you are beloved by the people who reside on the banks of the Three Rivers. Oh, don't you cut me off. I, I, I'm getting nice to Shazier right now. I walked around and 3,000 miles away, it felt homey because people were in black and gold, waving the towels. They want to high five you if you're dressed in the same colors they are. But you know what I saw? I saw a lot of number 50 jerseys out there. People remember you, Shazier, and you are beloved and you are an icon to Steelers Nation for all of time. That is clear. You have They have not moved on in their mind, in their heart, and otherwise from, uh, from one of the guys who really stands out in the 21st century for the Pittsburgh Steelers, one of the great brands in sports. So uh, kudos to you. It was neat. I snapped some pictures for you while I was there too. Yeah, so I, I can I bask see the in the reflected actually- glory. I seen the pictures that you sent. I'm gonna be honest. I didn't expect you to say that, so I really, I really appreciate that. That that uh, that made me feel really good today. Um, that you know, you just made my day better, Shaq. So I, I appreciate that. Beep 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 beep. No, we don't have time for that. No, let's let's get out of here then. That's it for this episode. Of don't call to come back. Hey, so make sure you follow. 
rate and review the show on wherever you're listening. Check us out on YouTube on the Wondery channel and make sure to hit the subscribe button. See you all next week. Tonight we do it all, but we don't back down. Just give me one shot, one chance, I'ma take it. Fixing up the game, but these records I keep on breaking. Break it.